Wealthy couple Tex and Diane had it all. A luxury condo, an 85-acre ranch, and a $60,000 diamond engagement ring. But the privileged pair were not perfect. One hot night in September 2016, this dream marriage was horrifically broken apart. All it took was a rough neighborhood and an eager trigger finger, and Diane was dead. What secrets was this marriage concealing? And what led to its tragic end? Incriminating voicemails, a gun collection, and a life led in luxury. Let's dive into the story of Tex and Diane McIver. I was handling the gun. I did not realize it was in my lap. Right. And it went off. Claude L. McIver III, known as Tex, was born in Texas in 1943. Not much is clear about his childhood, and we know he was ambitious enough to graduate the University of Texas with a law degree in 1968. He went on to practice law in the state of Georgia, becoming a partner at a prestigious firm. He was also involved in politics. Over the years, Texas' profile had grown to the extent that he was appointed to the State Board of Elections by the governor. He was a prominent Republican and was also a member of the American Bar Association's Standing Committee on Gun Violence. Tex's wife, Diane, was an influential person in her own right. Born in Auburn, Alabama in 1953, she had had an unhappy childhood, fighting constantly with her mother. She left home as soon as she turned 18 and soon entered the world of business. Under the mentorship of businessman Billy Corey, she went from answering the phones at his company to becoming its president. This meteoric rise was celebrated by everyone around her. She was an efficient leader known for getting things done. She would wake up at 5 a.m. to exercise before work and even kept weights in her office while working on the company's high-profile advertising contracts. Together, the pair made quite the power couple. But how did they meet? Around the turn of the millennium, Diane had moved into the affluent Buckhead Heights area in Atlanta, specifically in a luxury complex called The Villa. One day, shortly after she moved in, a note was slipped under Diane's door while she was at work. One of her best friends, cosmetologist Danny Jo Carter, was in the apartment at the time and read the note out to her over the phone. It was from Tex, who was also living in the building, welcoming her to the neighborhood. Diane and Tex had both already been married and divorced to other people. Tex's divorce had been so bitter that he rarely spoke to two of his three grown children. He had not even been invited to his daughter's wedding. Diane, still smarting from her own divorce, had reservations about getting into a new relationship. When Tex asked her out, she said no. This happened more than once. Diane told him she wanted to focus on her career, but Tex was persistent. Finally, she agreed to have dinner with him at his apartment. She wore workout clothes and a baseball hat, which suggested she wasn't that enthusiastic about the date. But Tex soon won her over and they started a relationship. Tex leased out his apartment and bought the one next to Diane's. They tore down the wall between the two units, creating one super apartment to live in together, reflective of their wealth and status. She also spent a lot of time with him on his 85-acre cattle ranch in Putnam County. Throughout all of this, Danny Joe Carter remained Diane's closest friend, to the extent that when Tex decided he wanted to propose, it was Danny he turned to for advice on the ring, which contained a $60,000 diamond. In 2005, Diane and Tex got married. They were 52 and 62 respectively. They had a country wedding at their ranch where guests sat on hay bales and Tex wore his Texas cowboy boots. Then they embarked on what to all initial appearances looked sure to be a successful marriage. They worked well together. They shared the same politics and frequently donated large amounts to Republican campaigns and causes. They both loved the outdoors and spent a lot of time at the ranch together. 
But the ranch was also a source of conflict in their marriage. Diane and Tex had a godson, Austin Schwal, who was born in 2006. The couple treated him like a son of their own. He was often with them at their ranch and their condo. Towards the latter half of their marriage, Diane started to suggest she wanted to name Austin in her will. Priority would still go to Tex, but if he predeceased her, she wanted her holdings to go into a trust for Austin instead of Tex's biological children from his first marriage. In 2011, Diane and Tex met with their estate lawyer to discuss this new will. Email chains made it clear that they'd been arguing about it. Diane emailed Tex to tell him there was no point in meeting the lawyer until they'd agreed on what they were going to do. He emailed back, upon what do we not agree? She responded, that I am not going to leave my half of the ranch to your estate. She expanded upon this in another email, for you to die before me and allow me to live there until I die and then turn it over to your estate is not an option for me. In 2015, Diane asked her friend and receptionist Rachel Sykes to copy a document for her. She called me in her office and said, I need you to make some copies of these papers. She said, I cannot trust anyone else. So I proceeded to the copy room and I made the copies and I went back and had them to her and she says, thank you so much. This is my new will. What this new will actually contained, we don't know. It was never found. But Diane's intentions were clear. She didn't want her assets to go to Texas children. And in making this will, she'd threatened their position and gone against Texas wishes. Ten years into their marriage, tensions were rising between the couple. Danny Joe Carter witnessed an argument between the husband and wife a few months before Diane's death. Their godson, Austin, the subject of all the contention around the will, was visiting with them at their ranch and he burned his finger. Diane and Tex got into an argument about it. Diane was saying he was all right. Tex was trying to get Diane to be quiet and they um, kind of got, a, they shoved each other and Tex kind of pushed Diane out of the bedroom and closed the door. This was one of the only times Danny had witnessed an altercation between Diane and Tex. It was a sign that things were escalating. Still, no one could have imagined how their marriage would end. It was a hot weekend in September 2016. Diane and Tex were spending time at their ranch riding and playing golf. They were hosting Danny Joe Carter, who was their frequent guest, and on the Sunday evening, they went out for dinner together. They went to Longhorn Steakhouse in Conyers with one of Diane's co-workers. They ordered a bottle of wine and Diane drank a few glasses. Tex had one glass. Danny, who didn't drink, volunteered to drive them back to the ranch. So at around 9.30 p.m. that evening, Danny got into the driver's seat of Diane and Tex's Ford Expedition. Diane was in the passenger seat and Tex was in the back directly behind Diane. The 73-year-old man soon drifted off to sleep. It had been a long, hot day on the golf course and he'd had a glass of wine. The two women chatted in the front of the car, but they were frustrated when backed up traffic slowed down their journey back to Buckhead, which should have only taken about 40 minutes. 25 minutes into the journey, Danny decided to exit the congested I-20 at Edgewood Avenue, hoping to avoid the traffic. They turned left and entered an underpass, at which point Tex woke up. And I came up and I said, the girls, where are, we? where are we and what's happening here? Right. We were clearly off our, our path. Right. And, uh, and that's how I first Tex was alarmed by their surroundings. We went through an area, uh, I could describe my familiarity with it, but we went through an area I thought it was particularly dangerous. Uh, it was an underpass. That's one that has a particularly high population of homeless people, okay. at least in the daytime. And, but at night, there were a lot of people there. Okay. And 
And I quickly said, uh, this is a big mistake, and we're in a place that we don't belong. Right. And, uh, of course, here we are in an almost new SUV and two women in the front seat. Right. And all that. So anyway, uh, they made a couple turns, and things were not going well. I said, we'll be on Piedmont shortly. And I said, you know, I'd like to, if you don't mind, please hand me my gun. Danny remembers this, too. Was anything spoken at that intersection? Yes. What? Uh, Texas, Diane, this is darling, would you, you hand me my gun? That summer of 2016, Atlanta had been rocked by Black Lives Matter protests. Tex was a prominent white attorney who, together with Diane, had founded a series of Blue Lives Matter billboards across the city. He remained nervous about unrest. This, he later claimed, was why he asked for the gun, and fatefully, Diane gave it to him. Tex described the moment. He was in the center console. Um, we've had some break-ins in our office where the only thing they're looking for seems to be a gun. And so I, in response to that, I had wrapped my gun in a public grocery sack. So okay. if you open the console, you have no clue what you're looking at. Right. And the flashlight and some stuff like that. So uh, Diane reaches in, pulls it out, uh, hands it back to me. And um, by then we may have been on Piedmont. Anyway, I'm relatively satisfied that we're out of you know, that kind of area. Right. And I guess I just I laid back again and went to sleep. Okay. This twilight zone kind of thing. Right. Had a weapon in my life. Okay. Um, and then what do you remember next happening? Um, Danny Joe came to a stop. And uh, anyway, I'm just just time to wake up, uh, but she came to a stop, and uh, I was handling the gun, uh, and I realized it was in my lap, right. and, and it went off. Tex had shot his wife in the back. Danny didn't realize what had happened immediately. I heard a big boom, and I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I thought there was an explosion somewhere and my, but my head turned to the right and I looked out the window and wondered where there was an explosion or if somebody behind us was getting ready to hit us or something had happened behind us. I did not realize that, that it was a gunshot. Tex made no effort to deny what he had done. The gun was quite literally smoking in his hands. They sped to a hospital where Diane was rushed into surgery but she was still unconscious. And when asked if she wanted to see her husband, she said no. Diane died in surgery. She had told doctors that it was an accident, but was she telling the truth? Or was this the final act of devotion from a woman who loved her husband despite it all to protect him from the consequences of what he might have done? Had she been murdered? A nurse at the hospital overheard something suspicious from Danny and Tex that night. They were huddled in a corner as if they were conspiring. She heard Tex say this. This is what you're going to tell them. Could them be the police? Was he asking Danny to lie for him? Witnesses reported that around the time of Diane's death, Tex appeared curiously unemotional. A few days before Diane's memorial service, he commented to a friend on the state of an ex's relationship. All he said was he didn't think she was happy with her husband, who was less, and that maybe he could get her back. Only weeks after the final shooting, Tex was already talking about starting new relationships. This was strange behavior for a man who had supposedly just lost the love of his life. He also began to arrange estate sales of Diane's belongings even within the first few weeks after the shooting. And he kept a pistol in his sock drawer despite a judge ordering him to surrender his firearms. This was at least in character. Tex had always been big into guns, but it had implications for this case too. The gun that had killed Diane was a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. If the hammer was cocked, 
the gun would only have required two and a quarter pounds of pressure to fire, effectively a hair trigger. If it had been cocked, then Tex's story of an accident might be credible. But if the hammer had been uncocked, the trigger would have required over five times that pressure. The truth remained unclear. But a gun expert said this. It was either intentional or uh, <laughs> the result of just incredible stupidity and ir irresponsibility. The only time you should have your finger on the trigger is when you are ready to fire and you are sure of your target. Tex, for whom shooting was a hobby, should have known this. It was enough to cast doubt on his story, and he had been involved in a shooting before. In 1990, Tex was indicted for aggravated assault. He had returned home to the house he shared with his first wife to find strangers loitering in an SUV in their cul-de-sac. When he went out to confront them with his handgun, they drove toward him. He fired what he told police were warning shots, two of which hit the passenger side of the car. No one was injured, and the charges were dropped after Tex agreed to pay restitution. But it struck prosecutors as an alarming pattern. Tex had been around guns all his life and wasn't afraid to use them. How then could this tragic shooting of his wife have happened, and why? They turned to the matter of the will and money in general. Diane was a highly successful business executive, and Tex was a high-flying lawyer. But he had wound up owing his wife $350,000. He had borrowed the money to build a $1.3 million barn on their ranch and had not paid it back, though it had been due with interest in December 2014. When Diane was killed, he inherited $4 million. Could money have been a factor in the shooting? No one denied that Tex McIver had shot his wife. The question was whether he had done it deliberately. He was brought to trial in 2018 and the prosecution called dozens of witnesses, many who testified to his strangely unconcerned behavior following the shooting. They also played a voicemail recording Tex had left for Danny's husband, urging her to stop talking to the police and to make a public statement in support of his innocence. Let me just be plain. Danny is about to send me to prison. Please erase this, this voicemail message, but call me right away. Y'all have no idea the problem this is causing. It's innocent, but it's absolutely nuclear for me. The voicemail suggested he knew he was guilty, and he was afraid of the consequences. In 2018, the jury agreed. Tex was convicted of felony murder and sentenced to life in prison at the age of 75. But this wasn't the end of the story. In 2022, the conviction was overturned on the basis that the jury should have had the option of a misdemeanor involuntary manslaughter charge. In other words, the higher Georgia court believed that the shooting had been an accident after all. Tex faced a retrial for felony murder, but in January 2024, he took a plea deal pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Do you understand that you weigh any and all defenses by entering a plea of guilty here today? Yes. And is it your decision to weigh these rights and enter a guilty plea because you're in fact guilty? Yes. The plea deal meant that Tex was sentenced to eight years in prison, including time served. That means he'll be released by 2025. However, he is immediately eligible for parole, so he could be released even sooner. What are your thoughts on this tragic story? Was the court right to overturn Texas conviction? Do you believe it was an accident? Or has he gotten away with murder? Until next time, stay safe. Keep up with our channel, and we'll see you very soon on The Decoder.